evening, the lecture tonight, Leilui Nishmat Avram ben Ephraim Zubli, Lerfuat Sara Bat Yulia, Leilui Nishmat Mazal Bat Ksia, in Chasov, Zivu Gagun le Mordechai ben Lori, Zivu Gagun le Daniel ben Ilana. Today that there was a, a very big tragedy today in the morning. I don't know if you heard the news already or not. No. A mother of six died today. Yeah. In Queens. <coughs> there are so many tragedies. I'm so confused already. I'm confused. I, d I don't remember the details. There are too many. Cannot keep up. We get phone calls from everywhere, messages. Unfortunately. And the sad part is that the people that still it did not hit them yet, they're still busy with the usual nonsense. We're going to Florida, we're going here, we're going there. We're looking for a home, we a vacation home. Yes, we're gonna change yes, a car, sir. we need another car. What kind of jewelry we're gonna put in a wedding, you know, all the usual nonsense. So many people are collapsing, so many soldiers are dying, so many families became miserable, and by them it's business as usual. I remember we once made a lecture here, Nose Ba'olim Havero. One of the requirements that Hashem has from every Jew is to feel the burden, to feel the, the weight of the entire nation. I cannot be Poresh Minatsibu. Believe it or not, people that do not participate with what the public do, if everybody retail him, ah, it's not for me. People crying right now, it's not for me, it doesn't apply to me. Whatever people are doing, they decide now we're building Bet HaMikdash, ah, it's not for me. I live my own life, I'm not a part of it. It's, it's massive, massive punishments for people like this. You can read in Rashid Chochma, in Masechet Genom. If I remember correctly, it's Mador Shlishi Bagenom, a Porshim Midarche HaTzibur. And one is reading Tehillim now, it's a big, big problem, war, uh, massive casualties, all kinds of things like this. Ah, by then business as usual. Tisha B'Av, everyone sit on the floor, cry for the destruction of the temple. They go to work. Manhattan, as usual, first thing in the morning, they're already by the business. Doesn't apply to them. You know what it means, no se ba'olim chavero? You know, every day when you get the mail, I'm sure you get at least two, three envelopes of uh, requesting charity. Orphan, widows, family, someone died, someone needs a kidney, someone has cancer, family of a soldier, you know, all kinds of things. Shiva, Shiva is about to close, synagogue, problem, lawyer, someone is in jail, got to release him. So many envelopes coming. What happened when a person is poor? Doesn't have money. Barely pays bills. Life is very expensive now. Very expensive. One kosher sandwich is more than $20. I see, sometimes I open the mail, I see, I open, I see, check, nine dollars, check, five dollars, check, three dollars. People still live in uh, 50 years ago. They don't understand the value of money. What are you going to do with five dollars? The gas to go to the bank to deposit it costs more. Yeah. They're not realistic. What are you going to say? They're dying to donate. That's what they can afford, poor people. What's the solution? You accumulate $50, five, three, two, nine. Once you have a substantial amount, if you can call $50 a substantial, 
what is it, two sandwiches? It's really uh, what used to be and what today the world is, is a whole different story. I used to live in uh, Manhattan when I was single in a two-bedroom apartment for $1,300. Today it's six, seven thousand, that apartment. Five, six times more. Gas is four times more. Sandwich in Manhattan, in a kosher place, tw between 20 to $40, one sandwich, depending on what's in it. You know, it wasn't like that. It was two, three dollars a whole meal. You can survive back then with five dollars a day as a single guy with food. You buy for the entire week for a hundred dollars. You used to go to Petmark, downtown Manhattan, next to Seaport there, if you know. It used to be a Petmark. Mm -hmm. Fill up the whole wagon for a hundred dollars. Today it's a thousand. Same wagon for the whole week. So, a cup of coffee costs more than five dollars today. Well, you send a five dollars donation, what do you expect the person to do with that? It's not one gallon of gas almost. So either it's people that still live in the old days and are not connected to reality, or they are so anxious to give tzedakah, give them the benefits of the doubt. They're so anxious to give tzedakah, so they bother to make a check for five dollars and mail it. Go to the mailbox to drop it, I don't know how they do it. Sometimes you gotta use your head. You know, you have to understand that this money, unfortunately, is no longer valuable. It doesn't have any value. So you have to put an, an amount, as long as it takes. No one puts a gun to your head. Little by little, here, I just you saw the boy out there with his mother, they waited for me to arrive. Yep. Bought a bag, Ziploc bag, with lots of singles and fives and quarters and pennies that he collected for six months. The boy, it was over $50 there in a bag. Singles, fives, quarters, I didn't even count the quarters yet. But from what I've seen the money now, over $50, the, the boy, it's nine years old, eight years old, the boy. I asked him, how do you have so much money? He said, I collect it, little by little. That's all you have to do. What can you do? Not everyone is rich. So, you know, you have different kinds of people in the world. People that spend tons of money on nonsense, and people who don't have five dollars to survive. It's reality right now. That's why I'm going to talk about what we read on Shabbat in a, par in a parasha. If you pay attention, is parasha Truma. The Torah say, "Kuli Truma, take Truma for me. Take, not give. Take." What does it mean, take? I the way to teach you an important foundation. There's no such thing to give. You only give yourself. Whatever you do for others you will realize one day, sooner or later, that it was all for yourself. All for yourself. I remember one time in yeshiva, one guy wanted to collect some money from the audience. So he said to them, we need, the yeshiva needs money. Oh, people that are working there, business people. The yeshiva needs money. The yeshiva is doing very bad. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago this story was. The yeshiva needs money, please don't miss the opportunity. Don't let the yeshiva close, you know, some things like that. He was trying to touch their, uh, their heart. So the rabbi, he has very strong emuna. He turned around, you know, sitting with his back, close to the Aaron Kodesh, like this, facing the wall. He turned around and he said, no, you got it all wrong. The yeshiva does not depend on them. The yeshiva is depend on Hashem. If he wants the yeshiva to keep going, it will go. If he wants it to be closed down, it will be closed down. Now, if he would like the yeshiva to keep going, it's his obligation to find who will support the yeshiva. If they want to get the merit, they'll get it. If they want, somebody else will get it. The yeshiva is, does not depend on them at all. No relation, no connection between the donor to the receiver. 
They receive and receive what was written for him in Rosh Hashanah. The homeless in the street, the Jew, the Goy. Can you spare a quarter, brother? Freezing like this in 20 degrees out there. On Rosh Hashanah, Hashem wrote to this Goy how much he's going to have income from all these quarters and fives. And from the Jewish homeless, or from the anyone, even the drug addict. It's written in Rosh Hashanah how much will come to his hand. It must come to his hand, it must. If no one will choose to give him, no one. How is it going to come? If Hashem wrote him $10,000 this year, and now one person wants to give him, people have their own uh, choice, their own will. Everybody looks at him, I don't like this guy, I don't want to give him. Everyone decided not to give him. How Hashem's will is going to happen? He wants him to get 10000 He'll make him find a wallet from someone that deserves to lose $10,000. Or, or the government all of a sudden will decide to send him a check. It's many, many, there's many, many ways. He'll find a diamond ring in the park where he sleeps and sell it to someone, hey, would like to buy it. It's worth 30, give me 10. Why not? It's great. Watch, you'll find a nice expensive watch. There are many, many ways. Many ways that a person can make money. So in the end, remember, every receiver will receive only what's written for him in Rosh Hashanah. Not a penny more. If people would choose to give him more than Hashem wanted, you can prevent it, right? If Hashem wrote for him this year $50,000 income, and, and he started to cry and make a show, and people start having mercy on him, and they open up their heart, and they gave him a lot more than 50000 More than 100 they gave him. But Hashem wrote in Rosh Hashanah 50. What are you going to tell these people? Don't give him, because Hashem doesn't want. They don't know it. So they opened up their heart, and they were very generous with him. So he made 100 instead of 50. Hashem wanted 50, he made 100. What will happen to the extra 50? Someone will rob him. He will have dental issues. He will have uh, all kinds of other problems. Car accident. His child would lose something. His child will call him, Abba, I'm arrested, I need a lawyer. Hashem has many ways. The angel will go on fire. Angel right there is angel of a car. It's more than 10,000 now. Just that alone. In the end, it will always align to the number that it's written. I went uh, on Monday to uh, engagement to say Mazal Tov, before the lecture yesterday. So I said the father, to the father of the bride, I said, a good guy, very nice guy, a beautiful family, both families, beautiful families. See how she make beautiful shiduchim, mamash impressive. So I say to the father, while we were dancing on the dance floor a little bit, I said, I said, I had to scream to his ear, you know, the music. I said to him, on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem wrote every detail already of your, of your daughter and the boy. How they meet, how they're going to finalize it, how the engagement, how the ring will be, how the engagement party will be, how much gifts you're going to get, everything. How much it would cost you, the food, the DJ, you know, the place. It was already written in a script. Now you have to watch and enjoy the show. <laughs> Do nothing. <laughs> You're not the one who gives the money even though you think you are. You just have to sit and enjoy the show. Why? The designer design every detail. Every detail. How things work from here, from there, from an unexpected place. One person over there said today to me, speak, speak to the DJ. Why? The DJ is a nice guy, but he, he makes also parties in a non-kosher event. You know, not every event is religious. So I come, I want to give him a USB. He said, how come, Rabbi, you never came on my radio show? I didn't even know he's a radio show. Supposedly he had some kind of a blog, I don't know what. I come to try to help him, 
He said to me, why don't you, why come you never came on my radio station? You never invited me. Okay, give me my number. One thing leads to another. It's all a part of the script. So, Khuli Truma, meaning you're not doing me a favor. You will give, fine. You don't give, someone else will give. Nobody else will give. I'll find different ways to do it. <laughs> I don't depend on you. The poor person doesn't depend on you. The yeshiva does not depend on you. The kiruv does not depend on you. We are doing you a huge favor that we approach you. So I started to explain. <coughs> you open the envelopes. Please help a mother of 13. Her husband just died. Wow, what are you going to do? You broke. You don't have money. What are you going to send them? Three dollar check? She needs thousands of dollars every month to survive. And you open the next envelope. Help, this yeshiva is collapsing. I don't have a penny, I'm sorry. After a while, what happened? You don't open the envelopes anymore. You see over there, help, we need your help, support, this. You see already from the outside. Ah, they want the credit card number. So what do you do? You don't even open the envelope. Right away, you take the tzedakah request, put them in the garbage, open your bills, or some checks that you got, and you move on with your life. Right? That's what most people do. I'm not even talking about the rich people who does it. They even don't open some of these envelopes. That's another problem. But I'm talking about the poor right now. You ask the poor, you're not embarrassed of yourself? Every day you, you throw two, three envelopes to the garbage of miserable people you don't even open. He will answer, why should I waste my time? Anyway, I can help them. You want me to eat my heart? I will read now about this widow and the orphans. What is it going to help me? I barely can pay my own bills. How is it going to help me that I'll read about her? So what should we do? The answer is, you can still do a lot. You open the Tehilim, and you read three chapters for her. Shem, money, you know I cannot give her. I'm reading Tehilim for you to have mercy on this widow and give her what she needs. Now you participated, participated, just as much as the person who wrote her a check and mailed it. The Tehilim helped just as much as the money. Why? Because Tehilim change from, from judgment to mercy. Let's see the Satan has judgment on this family. Judgment. The more people pray for them, it's a lot of mercy comes. At one point, Hashem said, we cannot disappoint 10,000 people. 10,000 poor people read this month Tehilim for this widow. They all got the envelopes. 10,000 poor. Achorei Shivot, poor families. Teenagers that could not help financially, but they read Tehilim. 30,000 chapters of Tehilim were read for this widow. I can't ignore it. I have to send her an insurance check. Why she got the insurance check? In the, in the beginning, they told her, no chance for you to get. You're not entitled. Shem twisted the mind of that underwriter. And he decided, after all, that she's eligible to get, and she got. Or oh, the government approved her. So many things, so many details. So you can actually help. You can actually help by reading the Ilim. So, Rabotai, the question we have to ask is why Parashat Ruma comes right after Parashat Mishpatim. You know, nothing is coincidence in the Torah when there are two chapters are close to each other. That means there's some kind of a connection between them. Why Parashat Ruma comes right after Parashat Mishpatim? That means they have some kind of a connection. Also, we could ask if they have a connection and they're close to each other, why is not vice versa? Why not first Parashat Ruma and then Parashat Mishpatim? If Hashem organized it in the Torah in such a way, He wanted people first to read Parashat Mishpatim, 
all the laws over there, and then to go into Parashat Truma. The question is why? What's the connection? The answer is, if you finally give a donation, you have to do everything you can for the money to be clean money. Not money with corruption, with stealing, with cheating. Parashat Mishpatim is the laws of finance. Who owes who? Who damaged who? The bad din. It's orders for the Jewish court to make justice by people. After you make justice, um, whatever the bad din say it's yours, that's a clean money. That's it. It's a verdict in a court. In a, in a court of Hashem, not a court of some gays from Paris. They're not exactly judges. The court of tzaddikim that really care to do the will of Hashem. So they say, Reuven have to give Shimon $5,000. Shimon got the $5,000, it's kosher money. What happened if the bed didn't make a mistake? One detail they, they didn't have. Or one witness lied. And they relied on his testimony. And based on that, they told Reuven he has to give Shimon $5,000, but it was the wrong verdict. It wasn't fair. Obviously, you cannot blame them. They're not God. They can only go by the evidence. What happened in the end to Shimon? That he got this money and he wasn't entitled to get. Is he guilty? Is guilty or no? He just got $5,000 from an innocent person. Reuven didn't owe him the money. Huh? Very good. Say the Rebbe Tzen, Safdi, that uh, some people just have always the right answer. Male, female. It's good to have one like this in the lecture. One on the right, one on the left. It's good. So, if from Shamaim Hashem confused the bad din with missing evidence or with wrong evidence, and in the end they ruled that one person will pay to the other, that means that Hashem had a different interest than the case. It's nothing to do with the actual case. It's something from past life. Could be husband and wife in their past life, these two. And he didn't pay her her ktuba. Divorced her and didn't give her the money. And that's the difference. You know, I want to tell you something. You know, in Beddin, a lot of people get out, they leave the Beddin angry. What kind of a court is this? Corruption. So, let me ask you a question. If a person comes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, I just slaughtered this cow. I'm not so sure about the long, if it's kosher or not. If it's kosher, you can make $5,000 profit on a cow, selling at the stakes. Big money. If the rabbi would say, oh, there's a tiny hole here, air comes out, it's not kosher, taref. You have to give it to Ahmed. Ahmed, come. Take it. So, Ahmed will eat it. Why will eat it? For him, it's halal. They don't check the lungs or they don't have oral Torah. It's enough for them that he was slaughtered. It's halal. <laughs> halal. What halal means, who knows? The meaning of the word halal. No, in the Torah, not in Arabic. <laughs> Empty. Empty. Like their head. They don't have the real Torah. They have only one thing in their head, murder Jews. That's all they care about. But you suffer, we will. But your town will be destroyed, let it be destroyed. But your children will die, let them die. It will cost you billions of dollars, no problem. What's the goal? We kill few Jews. We are the happiest in the world. They don't ask for much just to murder Jews. Mm -hmm. For that, they're willing to pay any price. Any price. Their own town will be destroyed. Why? They murder a few Jews. Don't get the wrong impression. 
even if they knew in October 7 that they will only kill 50 Jews, not 12, 1300, 50, in one shot, and that will be the price they pay, they'll still do it. Not like some people think. If they knew what's coming for them, they would think a million times before they make that attack. Wrong. They're willing to sacrifice a thousand of their children to kill one of you people, the Jews. One. Tell them. You're going to take a Jew and burn him. And you're all going to be dancing and clapping like you do. But we'll kill a thousand of you a minute later. No problem. We're happy. That's reality. I said, if you remember already a month ago or more, before I went to Israel, a month and a half ago, that Sinwar is already in Egypt. Remember I said that in the lecture in Queens? Today they discovered that he's already in Egypt. No, oh, Egypt won't take him, people told me. They're not going to dare to do such thing. People are dumb. Do you think there's any difference between Hamas and Egypt? Any difference between Egypt or Syria or Lebanon or Hezbollah or Hamas or Saudi Arabia or Qatar? Any difference between them? They are all racist Nazis who have one thing in their mind, to murder Jews, and after that to start with the Christians. Jews are their priority, but they hate Christians almost as much. That's it. That's the ideology over there. So he's now in Egypt probably living in a nice, beautiful home that he owned already from before. After all, he have $5 billion that he stole from the stupid European and Americans that give the money, thinking he goes to Palestinian people. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't understand what's going on. The Europeans and the Americans. It's a very sad joke. Every one of their leaders have $5 billion and up. It was published, their financial record. Some countries in Europe froze their account, they didn't even tickle them. 200 million, 100 million, 50 million, froze the account. Oh. If you steal from me a quarter, I'm gonna lose sleep over it. A minute later, I will forget about it. Right or wrong? You know anyone who cry over a quarter? The answer is no. I once had a case like this. I, I, I went to give a lecture somewhere, and the woman said, I need to speak to you, but not in front of a shul, one block away. I don't want the community to see that I'm talking to you about a personal issue. She had a problem, some family issue. When I arrived, Rabbi, today I decided I will donate $54 to your Kiruv. I said, thank you so much. She asked me all her problems, I answered her what to do. The Rabbi, Please don't be upset. With your permission today, I will give 36. I said, no problem, <laughs> no problem. She talked another two, three minutes about her problem. Rabbi, today will be only 18, but later next time I'll try to do better. I said, no problem, no problem, 18. They give it another five minutes, she will ask me to give her money. <laughs> no. No, but why I, why I'm telling you the story? What difference does it make? 36, 18, doesn't really make that much of a difference. The, the sad joke over here that when she wrote the 18, <laughs> I promise you, she was holding herself not to cry from a broken heart. <laughs> so there are people that apparently will cry when they give a few dollars. Yeah, there are people like this, but that's already a mental disease. It's not normal. So we're not talking about this. We're talking about they have so much money, they freeze, they freeze. And yeah, they'll make a few phone calls to Qatar. Hey, we broke, we need money. Why don't you send money? By the way, the Palestinians, they don't need the mercy of the world. They can get as much money as they want. As much money as they want. They name the numbers. Any money they want, they just make one phone call and they get it. How? How? Iran, Hezbollah. No. No. They can call any country they want. Not only Arabs in Iran or Turkey. No. Any country. France, Germany, Mexico. Any country you want. Brazil. 
We want you to send us a hundred million dollar by the end of the week. If not, we would look at you as a hostile, you anti-Palestinian, you don't care about our children. We're going to start making attacks in your land. It will cost you billions for security. We're going to start blowing up places, buildings, restaurants. Don't try us. In 48 hours, send us the money. A minute later, the wire will be made. Nobody wants to deal with them. Nobody, no prime minister wants now restaurants in his place in New York blowing up. If they call Biden, in one minute he said, why only a hundred million, Ahmed? <laughs> of course we feel your pain. No, we want to give you a lot more than that. 300 is good. There's only one problem. In the end, by mistake, he sent it to Israel. He forgot who spoke to him. <laughs> By the time he went to IR, he forgot. He said, where is the money? Hey, Joe, it's Ahmed, Sinwar. Yichye Sinwar. We didn't get the 300 million. What do you mean? I sent it. Check. Oh, I by mistake sent it to Bibi. <laughs> so let's get serious. One of the concepts, one of the concepts of the parasha that we learn is Hashem is asking us to make him a, a home, to build a home for him. Hashem needs a home. It's melokol aretz kvodo, everywhere you go. Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is everywhere. It's in this world, it's in the upper world. It's not one inch in space that you can say Hashem is not there. What's the significance of making him a beautiful building with some gold and marble? That's what he needs. It's, it's an insult to think that Hashem needs this. Build for him this way, that way, make, it, make the wood like this, make it this size, that size, this paint, that paint. What is the whole concept of the Mishkan? Vasuli Mishkan Veshachanti Betocham, not Betocho. It looks like a, a mistake in the text. It should have been, make me a home that I should live in it. But it doesn't say in it. It says in them. Mm -hmm. Meaning in the heart of each one of one of us. But when you make a temple, I come to live inside the head and the heart of each one of you. Can't you just come to live inside my heart and my mind without that building? What's the significance of the building? The answer, the building is for Hashem or the building is for us? Hashem needs the building? Every person that thinks that Hashem needs a building to live in it, and it makes him something special. He's either an ignorant or an heretic, one of the two. To say that Hashem is a, needing in, a needy in any form or any kind of need, that's 100% heresy. Just like the, the, the prophet say, if Palta, he say, he gives a, a few examples. If you do good, what did you do for him? If you do bad, what did you do for him? Everything you do, you do for yourself. You cannot change Hashem. Ani Hashem lo shaniti, it says. So what is the whole idea of, the, of a temple? What is the idea? For us to feel a place of connection to Hashem. It has to be a place that is special. Not every day. If you're every day there, you don't feel it. That you come three times a year in, a, in a holidays. Everybody comes there for three times a year. Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. Or if you need re uh, repentance, atonement. So you come to sacrifice over there. 
So the concept of having a house for God is not for him, it's for us. Once the temple is there, one of the things that influence the people besides the gathering there is the miracle. There are 10 miracles that are happening there every day. You come, you see it, and you get the shock of your life. You see right away that the spirit of Hashem is in that house. For instance, the smoke of the sacrifices, in a windy day, you know, in Jerusalem, in a mountain, there is uh, always wind, always, even in the summer. You feel the wind in the mountain. So you have wind, and when you barbecue, right, you burn lamb or beef on a grill with lots of fire. You put the entire animal and, they, and the animal is burning, and you know the smell, right? The shish kebab smell. Reach nichoach. What does it mean, reach nichoach? It's the greatest smell. Why all the restaurants make a big chimney and the smoke is two blocks away in the whole area? Do you know how many customers the smell brings them every day? <laughs> People finish their meal half an hour ago. They already had lunch. It's waiting for the bus by the bus stop. I have to have a steak now. I must. <laughs> Every minute. But you just say, hey, Joe, I, I can't. I won't be here for months. Who knows when I'm going to be here next time. Make me a nice steak. It's full. The smell drove him crazy. That smell has some kind of a effect. Now, when the smoke goes up, if, if there is a wind, it spreads everywhere. But in Beta Mikdash, it goes smooth, straight, like a pole. No matter how strong the wind is, the smoke concentrate and walk and goes up like, like one line. Every day like this. Where they cut the meat, hundreds of animals. Cutting, removing the heads, heads of animals. Do I have to tell you how many flies should be there? <coughs> and the terrible smell there? Do you ever went to the back of a butcher shop? Try to do it one time. See, see the smell there. Go inside. No matter how much they wash it and clean the floor, it's always going to be hundreds of flies. Blood, there's tons of blood. The blood attracts flies. They come. In Beit HaMikdash, they never found one fly. <coughs> Hashem shows you a miracle. No matter how much meat and how much blood, raw meat, no flies coming. Women smell the smell. Nah, nah, never a woman had a miscarriage. If a woman is hungry and she smells uh, barbecue and you don't give her to eat, there is a big risk she can lose the baby. It's no joke. Even if it's on Yom Kippur, you have to let her eat. If she insists that she must eat, you let her eat. Even if it's not kosher. Why? It's a life risk. Pikuach nefesh. Someone can die here. Pregnancy is no joke. It's a huge miracle to become pregnant. Huge. People take it for granted. Ah, my wife is pregnant. You know how many miracles happened for it to happen? Millions of seeds floating. One goes time microscopic right into the egg, penetrates inside, fertilizes it, and from that little microscopic dot, Bernie Sanders is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> he used to be a little dot, this Bernie. Until today, his brain like is like, like a little dot. <laughs> But someone like that came from a tiny microscopic dot. And when they do it in the lab, and then they push it in, hard to believe. Okay, so that's one miracle. Baby is developing now. By the 40th day, he becomes alive. 40 days. Then you begin to hear pulse. When you feel, when you hear pulse in a, in a speaker, 
boom, 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 boom. How, how big is the baby? You know how big? A quarter of this Bluetooth. You can, you can put him on two fingers, still won't cover it. You hear such a heartbeat. If you inject sugar into the wound, to the, wa to the water, he will drink double. He already felt flavors. By the third month, his nerve system works. It's the size of a cookie. Size of a cookie. Round like those cookies, what's the name of them that everyone likes? Oreo. Oreos. <laughs> size of an Oreo. Baby Oreo. So baby Oreo in a third month already have a nerve system, pulse, brain. He's aware of what's happening. If his mother play music, he either likes it or hates it, depends if it's nice or no. If the mother lights a cigarette, baby Oreo, position change to defense, like this. That's first time, second time. After a few times, when she only think that she wants to light a cigarette, only think, she didn't touch the cigarette yet. She didn't say, I need a cigarette. She just think that she wants to smoke, she has the crave, is already going to a defense position. It's all scientifically proven. And means not only is connected to his mother feelings and to what she eats, he also connected to her mind spiritually. So this cord that connects the baby, it's similar to the, heart, to the car, you know, when you have the cord you connected. So it's first, it's charging your phone, right? But at the same time, it's also a media cord. It does two different things. Charge is the food. The baby gets food from the mother through the cord. But apparently now we know that the cord is not just for food. It's also spirituality. It connects to her mind, to her neshama. So let him survive nine months. Has for shalom, nothing will happen, unexpected. And sometimes there are natural miscarriages. What does it mean? That there was some defect. The baby is not growing in the right way. So he falls after eight weeks, nine weeks, boom, blood. What do you do when it happens? Let's say a woman is now pregnant for the first time in her life. If the baby will be born and will be male, she's not only going to have Brit Milah for him in the eight days, She's going to have Pidyon Aben, redemption of the boy from the Kohen, after 30 days. It's two separate mitzvot. Meaning if the baby is yellow and it's not healthy yet, his liver is not mature yet, the skin is yellow, you cannot circumcise him. It's a life risk. So you wait a week, the Moel checks him again. You check again after a week, still not ready. Another week, still not ready. Oh, but the rabbi, in a few days, it's 30 days already. We have to redeem him from the Kohen, but we never circumcised him. Can we redeem him from the Kohen while he's still not circumcised? Yeah, one has nothing to do with the other. Mitzvah, in the 30th day, the Torah say, you come to the Kohen, you give him five coins of silver, pure, you buy him. And the Kohen releases him, because he, he, he actually own him. Every first moon automatically belongs to the Kohanim. Not literally to the Kohanim. The, it belongs to Hashem. And who is the representative of Hashem in the world? Kohen. The family of Aaron Kohen, all the Kohanim. It doesn't go by the last name, if your last name is Kohen or not. Many Kohanim, their last name is not Kohen. Yeah. Rapoport, Katz. It's also Kohanim. By the Bukharian, there's some families that they are Kohanim. It's not, the last name is not Kohen. So the last name doesn't mean 100% uh, if you're Kohen or not. And even if your last name is Kohen, there's no guarantee you're Kohen. It can be a fake last name. 
people used to buy the keuna by giving money back in the time. So just because his last name is Cohen, there's no guarantee he's a Cohen. And many of the Kohanim today, people that their last name is Cohen, they're actually not Jewish. Mm -hmm. 85% of the people in America that their last name is Cohen are not Jewish according to the Torah. They're Goim. Joseph Cohen. What can be a bad, better Jewish name than that? Complete Goim is Zera Amalek. His mother, German, the granddaughter of a Nazi. Zera Amalek. Some Israeli fool liked her, she's beautiful, they didn't care about the consequences. Married her, he has a child. A child, child have in him Zera Amalek. Mamash like this. And it's not, his last name is Cohen. Poor kid. <laughs> Technically, that's his fault. Now he's growing up. What's your name? Joseph Cohen. Can I make Birkat Kohanim with all the people in the shul, Rabbi? Uh, no. But I'm also called Cohen. My father is also Cohen. Yeah, but you're not Jewish. You understand? So now. To survive this nine months of pregnancy, it's already a big miracle. It's a miracle. People just take it for granted. And to give birth naturally, it's also a miracle. It's not everybody gets to give birth naturally. Sometimes they need cesarean. They used to do cesarean 2,000 years ago, the rabbis. It's in the Gemara. It's called Yotze Dofen. They used to take the baby from the side of the stomach. 2,000 years ago, the rabbis performed surgery, cesarean, cesarean, put the woman on a marble. Why marble? Marble, it's the easiest to clean and there's no germs. If you clean it, good. Doesn't attract germs. It's unbelievable. The, the knowledge they had 2,000 years ago, the chachamim. So, Over here, you know, if there is some kind of a defect, automatically the body ejects the baby. Now, if you were already planning to do circumcision, they told you it's a boy, and you already have in mind that you're gonna do pidyona ben, it crushed your heart. The wife calls the husband, Moshe, don't ask, what? I'm all blood, come on. We go to the doctor, the doctor said, we're very sorry to inform you, you lost the baby. Let's say a few months later, she's pregnant again. She goes to the doctor, they clean everything, make sure no, left, no pieces left inside can create infections and problems. A few months later, with the mercy of Hashem, she's pregnant again. She had a boy. Now, this boy, you do redemption from the Kohen or no? No. Ah? Remember what I told you before? <laughs> Rabbit sends something. <laughs> Depend on what day he fell, he was aborted. If he fell before 40 days from the pregnancy, there was no life yet. If she become pregnant again, it's considered firstborn. How do you know that? They check in the, in the, the entire thing with the placenta that dropped, whatever fell with all the blood, they check if there were actual organs, tiny hands or head, they check. If they see no pieces, no legs, no nothing. It's small, remember, size of an Oreo. Take a magnifying glass and you check. If there is no hands, no legs, no nothing, there was no, no baby was created yet. Doesn't have a shape of a person. Little tiny person. Like I said, size of a, of a cookie. If there were no pieces, next time she, 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 she gives birth to a boy, if it's a boy first time, it's considered first time, pidyon amen. But if it was after three, four months of the pregnancy, you don't need to check, you already know. So what happened? When they ask her in a, in a pidyon, the Kohen, they ask, 
Is this the first time you give birth? Is this the first time you give birth? What happened if she's embarrassed now in front of the whole shul? They're asking her. It's 300 people. What is she going to say? That she had an abortion when she, was, when she was secular with a boyfriend in Tel Aviv? She's not going to tell her husband that now. Her husband is a tzaddik, Baal Tshuva. She is a tzaddikah, Baal Tshuva. Ten years ago, she had a, an abortion in Israel. Why? She wasn't religious. She already forgot about it. Completed, erased it from her, mouth, from her mind. Now she's standing in the synagogue, happy. Brit Mila was three weeks ago. Now they stand in front of the, of the Kohen and they ask her, is this the first baby ever came out of your rechem? Peter rechem, it's called. First one that comes out of the rechem. All of a sudden it hits her. I actually was pregnant already before, 10 years ago, and I made, I made a, an abortion. What is she going to do now? If she say, no, I made an abortion, <gasps> the whole shul will drop dead, <laughs> or at least faint. Imagine the embarrassment. The Baal, the Baal, the husband would run away. <laughs> Maybe the rabbi is there in a, in a pidyon aben, can already sit and prepare the get. <laughs> So obviously she's going to be embarrassed and she's going to say, yes, that's the first time I'm giving birth. Now they're making brachot. They're mentioning the name of Hashem in vain. The whole bracha, this the Kohen make, is not supposed to, because it wasn't supposed to be. Pidyon Aben. One day she died, this woman. One day, after 150. She comes to her trial, they get to that date in a shul. They put her on a spot. Is this the first time you gave birth? No. I had, a mis I had a, an abortion. She's not going to say it. Yes, the first time. Why did you lie? Hashem, you know how embarrassed I was. I mean, I would rather die than to, to say, yes, I had an abortion. It would be a big embarrassment to me, to my parents, to my husband, to his parents. In-laws, to my sister, brother, you know how many people, the rabbi there, the rabbi said, how can I say no, I, uh, I murdered a baby when I was a hippie in Tel Aviv Beach. How would I say such thing? The answer is, she doesn't get punished. She doesn't get punished. Lechatchila, she's allowed to say yes. Why you do not embarrass a Jewish girl when it comes to modesty? For no matter what cause. Even if you say the name of Hashem in vain. Bracha levatala. That's what some of the poskim wrote. Al yalbin pnei chavero barabim it's an important law, of course, but it doesn't cancel other laws of the Torah. If, if you have to choose between this or doing something terrible against Hashem, of course, you're not allowed to break the laws of the Torah. But here it's not Chavero, it's particularly the girl, and not allowed. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. There is a question, you know, in the old days they used to live in a neighborhood, like the shape of a, of a U, of a chet. Square, square, but not fully closed. Only have three sides. One side is open to the public territory, to the main road. Like a development. Okay, like a development, but it's, the neighborhood has a square yard in the front. Right? Houses, one, two, three, and then one, two, three, and one, two, three, and then one side is open. It's not closed, the square. Why? That people can go to the major road. What do you do in that, in a, in a yard? People play, they park their horses, the donkeys, the camels, children run, children play with toys. What were the toys of 2,000 years ago? 
chicken heads. Did you ever go to the market in Israel when they slaughter the chickens? After that, they chop their head off. They have a pile of rooster heads. As a shuk. Bakarmel. Bakarmel, Atikva, Machne Yehuda. So they have, they have, they chop their heads off. So you see a lot of heads of chickens. Nobody eats it. So what do they do with that? They throw it to the kids. The kids' toys of those days used to be this. Try to tell a Jewish kid today, I got you a nice gift for Hanukkah. <laughs> Bring him a box. <laughs> he opens it up. Ah! The mother faint. The father is getting a heart attack. Hola <laughs> tzala. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, the Gemara asks a question. A father saw his baby doesn't stop crying. Drove him crazy on Shabbat. You know when the baby screams non-stop? At one point your alarm is set already, you don't know what to do. Now you need to calm the baby down. What do you do? He took a chicken, living chicken, boom! Chopped his head off, gave it to the kid, here, play, leave me alone. Are you allowed to kill any animal on Shabbat? No. It's one of the 39 restrictions of Shabbat. Netilat Neshema. But the Gemara make an argument. But it didn't mean to kill him. That wasn't his intention. In Shabbat, in order for you to violate Shabbat, first you need to have in mind what you want to do. Melechet Machshevet Asra Torah. Melechet Machshevet Asra Torah. What does it mean, Melechet Machshevet? I want now light. It's dark in a room. First, I have in mind, what do I need? I need light. Okay, I need light, let me create light. I go, I turn the switch, electric circuits closing, sending some electric to the area, the light is on. What happens if I lean on a wall not knowing there is a switch there? And I turn the light on. There is no violation on Shabbat here. But I created light. But it didn't enter my mind. I didn't want to turn the light on. In order for you to be guilty of Chilul Shabbat, you first have to have in mind what you like to do. Second condition, you have to do it in the normal way of doing it. Not in a strange way, with your elbow, with your with your back, with a stick. You have to do it in a normal way of doing. Why? Otherwise it's not a part of the Melechet Machshevet. It's not the normal way of people used to do things. So if you lean on a wall and the light went on, you didn't want light. You had no intention to create light. And you did not create the light in a normal way of light. So there's no Chilun Shabbat. But there is a difference, listen, pay attention. <coughs> if you forgot to date Shabbat, forgot. Early in the morning, you woke up, you come to wash your hands. You, for a second, you're still not uh, aware that it's to date Shabbat. For you, you went to the bathroom, middle of the night, boom, you turn the light on. And then all of a sudden, it hits you. Wow, it's Friday night. It's Shabbat. What have I done? So you didn't remember in a time when you turned the light on that it's Shabbat. So now when you created light, is that an intentional Chilul Shabbat or not intentional? Intentional. Not intentional. Why? Because you didn't know it's Shabbat. If you would know it's Shabbat, you wouldn't dare to touch the light. So you forgot it's Shabbat. That's called not intentional sin. Or, you, it could be you remember it's Shabbat, but you didn't learn yet that this transaction is forbidden on Shabbat. You were not aware that you're committing a sin. Either way, you had information missing in the moment that you did it. One time you didn't know it's Shabbat, you forgot it's Shabbat, so you, you had information missing in your head. 
And another time, you knew it's Shabbat, but you didn't know you're not allowed to clean the shirt from some stain to take water and clean it. And the host just told you, what are you doing? It's Shabbat. So, not allowed to do laundry on Shabbat. Oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Okay, you broke Shabbat. Not intentionally. If you know it's not allowed and you did it, that's death penalty. Stony. And a permanent cut for the soul. Karet. If you didn't know, it's not intentional sin. What's the punishment for not intentional sin? In the time of Bet HaMikdash, you had to take a keves, go all the way to Bet HaMikdash, lift it on your, head, on your shoulders, go up the mountain, give it to the Kohen, the Kohen slather it, you see all the blood on a, on a shechita. Wow, that should have been you, you repent, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Chilalti Shabbatot, I'm sorry, forgive me God. And that's a very big impact on your life. After that, usually you will never dare to break Shabbat for the rest of your life. But that was a not intentional Chilul Shabbat. When you lean on a wall, you had no intention to do anything. It's called mitasek. Mitasek means accident that happened, completely accident. I didn't think to do it, I didn't need to do it, I didn't want to do it. For that, you don't even need to bring any sacrifice. It's really nothing. The righteous people will still cry to Hashem when they pray and ask Him forgiveness for that. Hashem, you know, it wasn't on my mind, I just leaned on the wall, I didn't see there's a switch there, forgive me, but really technically they don't really need to repent because there was no intention at all to do anything, just to lean on the wall. What's the case with the, with the chicken? The father that just killed the chicken, he didn't want to kill the chicken and he doesn't want to eat the chicken. He didn't want to eat it, he has plenty of food for Shabbat. He wanted to give the baby a toy. Did he plan to kill the chicken? No, it wasn't his intention. He would prefer the chicken would stay alive. It would save him money. The reason he killed the chicken wasn't for the meat of the chicken. It was for the head, to give the head to the baby. If that's the case, is this considered now an intentional Chilul Shabbat? And not intentional? Or it's nothing. Which one of the three it is? Oh. The Gemara asked that question. The Gemara says it's still a violation of Shabbat. Even though it's Melacha Sheno Tzarich Legufa, he doesn't need the actual killing. He wanted just to give the baby the baby the, 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 the toy. Because it was obvious that that will be the results of his action, that the, the chicken will die, something that is guaranteed to happen, even if you don't have interest that it will happen, your interest is something completely different, but because it's obvious that it will happen, it's still breaking Shabbat. That's what the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat say. And they have an expression for it. Until today we use it. 2,000 years later, Pasik Rashev Eloy Amut, you chop the head of the chicken and he won't die. Rega, <laughs> 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 you know what, you know what, you know what he's saying? Rega, rega, don't forget there's a video, rega, tiraga. So, we have a, you know what he just said or no? No. No, I'll, I'll translate to you what he said. He said, yeah, it's possible you chop the head of the chicken and will continue to live. I saw a chicken that they chopped his head off and he still walked for five, ten seconds. That's nonsense. Why? I'll explain to you what happens. You know the body is a combination of physicality and spirituality, right? The nerve system, it's like an electric wire system. Like you have wires in the building, it goes from the generator to all the apartments, to every light bulb, to every device, to outlets. Someone wired the system. When you send the first boost of electric, when you turn the, 
the switch, the main switch on from the electric company supply. The electric begin to travel, right, to all the wires. Some places it reach a dead end, meaning the switch is open. It's like water. It's like the faucet is closed. The water are trying to come out. The faucet is blocking it. When you remove the obstacle, the water will come out. Same thing with electric. Electric is trying to go through the wire, but if you open the wire, the electric has nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. It stops right there. If you close it, it's like a gate. You close it, it continues to go. So that's how it goes. What happened with uh, chopping the head of the bay, of the, the chicken? What's happening? Before you chop the head off, the brain already sending pulses non-stop. Nerve system to every inch of the body. Same thing by us. It goes to every organ all the time. Check the situation. The blood is circulating, everything, nothing is broken. It's an unbelievable system. When you chop the head off, obviously from the minute the neck is disconnected, the brain cannot continue to send electric to the wires, right? To the nerve system. But before it was chopped off, it already sent, it sent already signals to all the wires. And they continue to travel. Therefore, he's still moving his legs because the brain gave an order before it was chopped. What is it like? Like the Wi-Fi. When the Wi-Fi die, right? Let's say the electric goes down, like a power outage. The download in your movie that you watch continue for another minute. There's no electric. The whole house is off. But you somehow able to watch another 30 seconds. What, where, where this 30 second comes from? This was sent before the power outage. But they continue to arrive, the signals. Once all the signals went through, boom, you see this annoying <laughs> circle on the screen. So that's how it goes. So therefore, if the chicken walks a few steps after you took his head off, it's not because he's able to be alive without a head. Because he already received orders. The legs, the legs that are moving already received the electric order to move. So they continue to move until the order stop coming. That's it. So going back to the chicken. So the, 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 the Gemara asks, that's so the kids playing. You see kids playing with chicken, playing, okay. Now, the Gemara asks a Jewish woman, she needs to do laundry. Today, go to houses here in Flatbush, Great Neck, Monsi, Lakewood, Queens, Jamaica Mistake neighborhood, all these areas. <laughs> Usually the laundry room is a very fancy room. Nice shelves, drawers, smells of heaven, big massive machine. A Jewish home. You gotta have a lot of kids, you need a lot to do. You need heavy duty machines. It's not the regular machine that the goyim have. A child and two cats. You know, you have a Hasidic family, 15 ninjas over there, every day they're full of mud, this, uh, yogurt everywhere. Massive loads, massive loads. Plus, you have so many guests for Shabbos, you gotta do the laundry, you have to do the blankets. It's massive. You cannot have a tiny, you know, those tiny machines like them. So, what happened? <laughs> Listen carefully. Today, a woman has such an unbelievable laundry room. Tuck, tuck, tick, tuck, tuck. Hair, dryer. Even to move from the washer to the dryer, she doesn't do it. The Amiga is doing it. <laughs> Senorita, por favor. No, no, vamos. Mandale. Rapido. <laughs> yes, senora, yes. Of course. Tuck. Oh, my life is so hard. I hate my life. Such a nightmare. I can't take it anymore. Why? I had to press an extra button. 
Senorita didn't come quick today. <laughs> the more spoiled we become, the more complaints we have. But back in the time, do you know how a woman has to do laundry? Try to imagine a, a Jap. You know what a Jap means? <laughs> Jewish American princess. <laughs> Take a Jewish American princess with her nails and two pencils in the heels of her shoes with her Gucci bag and the key for her Mercedes. Well, you have to do laundry for 15 kids today. Me? Yes, you. That's your chore for today. No, how would I do it? You have to collect all the laundry in a big basket, put it on your shoulder, go all the way to the lake, two miles from your home, in the rain, in the wind. You carry all the clothes, you come to the lake, you wash them with the hands, now they're heavy. You know, when it's wet, it's five times heavier. You put it back on your, head, on your back and you have to climb the mountain back to your home. It breaks your heart. Ah, my heels are killing me. The nails are breaking. I just yesterday went to manicure. <laughs> oh my God, I hate my life. Now she really hates her life. <laughs> to press two buttons, she cries. She comes. By the time she arrives to the house, the basket flip over. Wow, full of mud. She has to go now all the way down to the lake. Rinse everything. Finally, she made it. It's already six, seven hours operation. She has to hang them with clips. Back then, there were ropes. She had to tie them to ropes, and hopefully there will be a sunny day that it should dry. And she had to supervise that the kids in the area won't pull it or something, you know, after all the work. But the line, it was a disaster. Snigmara so now asks, she doesn't want to take the laundry to the lake. She wants to bring the lake to the neighborhood. How do you do it? She will dig a hole in the square yard that belongs to all the neighbors equally. So you need permission from the, from the neighbors. If you want to dig a hole there, big hole, you put some cement, you turn it into mamash like a mikveh. And then you go to the lake, you, your husband, your sons, they bring water. You spill water into that hole. You put whatever soap they used to use to clean the, the clothes. And she will do laundry in the neighborhood. Does she need permission from the neighbors? Yep. No. No. If it's public, no. That's the question. Usually you don't ask questions that are, you know, uh, uh, rhetorical questions. Of course she needs to ask questions. Everything you have to, to do, you have to get permission from the neighbors. Except this. Here she doesn't need to. Now you're ready for the answer of the Gemara? The Gemara said there is no alternative. Would you even imagine that a Jewish woman will dare to go to the lake or to a river and do the laundry over there where all the goyim passing or other Jewish men, that they will see a woman bending down like this. Everybody who passed with his horse would look at her in a public like this on the floor, doing laundry by the lake. It's totally unacceptable. It's not modest. It would be the end of the world. A Jewish religious war, everyone was religious and modest. Who would dare to send a Jewish woman to a public lake to do laundry that everybody that passed by would look at her? So who's going to do it for her? There's no one going to do it. So the answer? Of yeah. course not. So she will do the laundry in the neighborhood. 6 a.m., no one is there. She goes quickly, does the laundry, right next to the house, hang everything, and finish. I, some of the neighbors disagree. Hey, you're making the area ugly with your water here. What is this? Alacha. I don't need your permission. Why? Hashem doesn't allow me to go to a public area and bend down in front of hundreds of men who pass by and do laundry. It's not an alternative. Since there's no alternative, 
every Jewish woman in a neighborhood, they can all use that hall and do the laundry over there. Do you get the point or no? So what do you see? Some things is very embarrassing. Same thing with the redemption of the boy. You don't expect a woman to stand in front of an audience and say that she had a, an abortion. <coughs> First 40 days, there is no life yet. After the 40th day, that's it. There's neshama there, pulse, babies tasting, hearing, enjoying music, suffering from smoking or alcohol. That's why when I asked the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi, my son is three months old, when should I start educating him in life? From what age? The Chafetz Chaim said, <coughs> so when he was already in his mother's stomach, he should have done it. In the mother's stomach, why? That's when the baby is already beginning to understand what's going on in this world. What uh, some women, the Gemara said, they used to come to the Shiva, sit there all day, retail him for the baby to hear the Torah. Some men, they bring the baby, put them in a Shiva, while they learn there to hear noise of Torah. The night before the Brit, Everybody gathered to the house, we do Brit Yitzchak. Sfaradim, I think also the Hasidim, it's based on Kabbalah. The Zohar, it is called Brit Yitzchak. What do we do? We read parts from the Zohar. Before the baby will be circumcised tomorrow morning. So what do we do? We let him hear Torah. It's also written that the Malach HaMavet is very angry now that we're about to do this important mitzvah with Hashem, Brit Milah, circumcise a male board. So to prevent any chas v'shalom problems, we do that. The Ashkenazim, they have a nice minag. It's called Shalom Zachar. When the baby is born, first Shabbat that comes, they celebrate. Make like a gathering with food, blessing, Vivre Torah. Why is it? It's the first Shabbat in, that in, is in the world. Why from all the options, Hashem decided to circumcise the baby after eight days? Why not after six? To make sure that every baby that is born will have at least one Shabbat in his life before the Brit Milah. Why? Shabbat always comes first. That's why Hashem gave us Shabbat before He gave us the Torah. Before He gave us the Torah. I want you to know the importance of Shabbat. So I'm giving you Shabbat as a gift. This is a gift that was in my safe, Bebet Gnazai. I want to inform you, I said to Moshe, inform them that I'm giving them the most precious thing. That was before He gave us the Torah. For those who don't understand the importance of Shabbat. So, time is running out. Uh, let's see what, the, what does it mean. So, when we collect money to build the shul, there's a collection now. There are all kinds of comments by the people. Common comments. Some donate right away with nice generosity and they're happy to do it. There are some who agree to give but not from their own pocket. They will already raise it from others. They will raise it. And there are some people who will never give for such a cause will never give for such a cause. Rabbi Shalom Shvadron, you heard about Rav Shvadron? One of the best speakers that we had. Big Tzaddik. The Magid of Yerushalayim. Magid means a speaker. This is how he explained the verse. Problem, Benji? Oh my goodness.
Yes, again? No, it's not that. Ma. Every election, same story. Rav Shvadron used to say, this pasuk v'zot atruma asher tikhu, right? Zahav v'chesef u'nechoshet. Some people, some donors are equal to gold. Soon as they hear there is a collection for yeshiva, for shul, for whatever they want to do, they run to give. Let's be the first one. They're very happy. Why? I want to invest in such a good cause. Some people are equal to silver, not gold. You know how American Air Express have? Platinum, gold card, regular, right? Each one costs more or less and have different benefits. Same thing over here, gold, very precious. Silver, less. Copper, less. Tov. So, some people are like gold. They hear there is a, a, there is a need for money, for something holy, they run. How much you need, Rabbi? Next time, please, if you have something, let me know first. I want to be the first one to put the money. Smart people. They prepare the eternal life. They know where to put. They know what stocks to buy. Tov. Some people are equal to silver. They're not su such an upgrade. They come home and say, ah, I knew that lecture in the end would become fundraising. <laughs> See why I didn't want to go? <laughs> it's always about money in the end. <laughs> the rabbi needs money for the yeshiva, for his kiruv. Oh, oh, and then he asked me why I stopped, uh, stopped going. <laughs> they want checks. Tov, what can I do? If he comes, we'll give. If he doesn't come, we'll thank Hashem. <laughs> Tov. <laughs> In the end they gave, but like I say, like this woman that gave me the 18 and she almost cried. <laughs> Probably a week she didn't sleep after that. <laughs> there are people like this. They give because they have no choice. Everybody else gave. They look at him. Wow, you're not helping? You're not helping? Wow. You're not Jewish? Look, the Goim gave. You're not in Paris. Of course I'm giving. Relax. <laughs> Calm down. I'm just thinking if to give like you gave or more. <laughs> oh, what a generous guy. <laughs> and they are the third kind. They say, aha, they want money. They make sure not to come to the door. The maid. <laughs> what happens if there's no one in the house? Moshe, we know you're there. We see your car in the driveway. <laughs> Open the door. He comes from the window. I'm not home. <laughs> they don't come to the door. But what happens if the collector is clever? He knows already his tricks. He pretends he leaves, he goes around and hides. As soon as he comes out of the driveway to his car, <laughs> good <laughs> afternoon, Moshe. Long time no seeing. How are you? I want to tell you a story. Oh, you and your big eyes again. I'm a little in a rush. Oh, wonderful. So you can write the check faster. <laughs> <laughs> so, Abutai, no business is, uh, business is hard right now. Please, you don't pray enough for me. You need to pray for me more. Do you know what happened to me? I went to the ATM, it swallowed my card. <laughs> in Israel, <laughs> over here, worst case scenario, you stick your ATM, there's no money. 
He said, this transaction is not authorized. Decline. 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 In Israel, <laughs> they're harsh over there. You know, so what happened? The ATM swallow your card. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> Give me back the car. No. You already were declined a few places. You're not getting a card. They eat your card. So, what, what, so what's going to be? He tells him, oh, the Kaspomat, the ATM, ate my card. Tov, in the end, after a few times he came, they gave him a shekel. <laughs> Tov, where is your pushke box? They put a quarter. Tov. Now, King David, when he was old already, close to his 70, had a horrible experience in his life. Who rebelled against him? His son of Shalom. Most of the nation, almost everyone, went with Avshalom against David. Hard to believe. Few loyal one remain loyal to David. David had to ran out of the palace with no warning, barefoot. Didn't have time to put his shoes off. On. And it wasn't like today, you have cement everywhere you go, sidewalks, or thorns, rocks, all kinds of things on the floor, sand. He had to run with barefoot. Yachef. Why? I have to run for my life. He wants to murder me. Nobody opened the door for him. Knocked on people's door. I'm David. Give me shelter. We don't want to invest in you. He's taking over. We don't want to mess with him. We don't, know, we don't want to mess with him. Why should I risk my life for you? There was one person, his name is Barzilai Agiladi. Barzilai. Agiladi. From the Gilad. Huh? Yes. He came to David and brought him food and to the people that were with him. He had few people. Few days later, few weeks later, David is going back to the palace. And now, if he becomes sick, he's seven years old, he's shaking. He can warm him. No matter what they do, put fire, he's still shaking. They know it's, his end is coming. He calls his son Shlomo. Shlomo is about to be the king. How old is he? Twelve. Twelve. Between twelve and thirteen. He said to him, Vechazakta vaita leish. You gotta be a man now. That's it. There's no time to waste. You're about to be the king. <laughs> David's give him few instructions. Listen. He said, the minister, the chief of command, chief of command, Sar Tzva Israel, Yoav ben Tzuria, you have to kill him. He's a traitor. You have to kill him. Why? Let him repent, confess, kill him, that this death should be his atonement. That he should have a share to the world to come. For his own good, give him execution. Tov. Shimi ben Gera also. He, care, he cursed me and I was silent. Someone who cursed the king has a very big problem with Hashem. You need to punish him severely for him to have an atonement. But to the children of Barzilai, Agiladi, always be kind to them. Always support them. Always feed them. They are very special. The children of the one who saved him and gave him food. Because they are the only one who showed me help while I was running away from Avshalom. 
Now Rav Shvadron, with his brilliant mind, he said, let's pay attention to what's going on over here. He didn't say, because they brought me close to them. He said, they, they came close to me. They came close to me. What, what good was I? I was a homeless, running away from my life, being chased by, uh, uh, by a cruel trader son who wants to murder me with his army. I'm worthless. I don't, I, I don't have shoes. David say, don't ever forget them. They came close to me. He didn't say they brought me close to them. The right language should have been, they brought me in. So they came out to me. It should have been the poor king has no place to be, come be by me. But David doesn't use this language. He said they came closer to me. They came closer to me. To what? To my homeless situation? To my misery? To what? <laughs> they still understood that in Shamaim I'm still count like the king. I'm still a king in the eyes of Hashem. They wanted to get as close as possible to the messenger of God. Why they helped me? I didn't do anything special for them. Why you run to the tzaddik to help him? Why you call him? Do you need something? I heard you in town. Can I drive you? You collect. Maybe I can take you to a few people that can help you. You need a place to sleep? Are you here with your wife? Should I arrange for you? Where are you going to be? Tell me where you're going to be. I have friends everywhere. Why are they doing it? Because he has beautiful eyes? No. For only one reason. To make Hashem happy. When people run to help a rabbi, not their personal rabbi, personal rabbi or someone who made them religious, they owe him endless gratitude for eternity. If they won't do it, they are ungrateful people. We're not talking about a case like that. We're talking a stranger rabbi. They owe him nothing. He's a famous uh, Chacham, came from Israel, he's now in uh, Brooklyn. I have nothing to do with you, I never met you, you never taught me, I'm not your student, but I know you're holy man. I run, Rabbi, it starts, can I make you tea, something? Do you need uh, someone to drive you tomorrow? Who are you? Moshe, I live here in Flatbush. Do we know each other? No. So why you come to help me? I want to help you, you chacham. It's respecting the Torah. That's the most classy, smartest things to do. Someone wants success, the Gemara says, Give the chachamim a good wine. From, in the old days, used to make the wine by hand. The barrel, not like now. You come to the liquor store, you buy, and that's it. He's to a homemade with the grapes, stepping on the grapes, cleaning it, you know, sipping it. But it's a whole process. That's why only the rich people had barrels of wine. The Gemara says someone who does have dala on wine, he's going to have banim talmide chachamim. Every ignorant and every poor is doing have dala on grapes today. Grape juice or wine. What's the... What's, What's the big, today it's no big deal. You can buy a bottle for a few dollars. But in the old days there was such a process, you need a place to store them. Most people couldn't afford. Some chachamim couldn't afford. So if someone would take care of them to have wine, for kiddush, for avdalah, oh, what a huge merit. But I don't know him. Doesn't matter, you're not doing it for him, you're doing it for Hashem. Why? If you help someone Hashem loves the most, it counts like you are helping Hashem. You help the son, the son of Mr. X. Why are you helping him? It's because he's your son. Immediately, Mr. X is crazy about you. If one day you need something, he will turn the whole world upside down for you. 
simple common sense. Bnei Brazilai was smart. Hashem loves David, big tzaddik, holy, he's a king. Everybody is now care, only care about their personal gain or lost. Thinking politics, what's in it for me? Why should I jeopardize my relationship with his wicked son? After all, he's going to be in charge. But what about Hashem? Ah, no time for Hashem right now. It's time to improve our connection with the new leader. They're thinking he's going to be the new leader. Everything turned around to their face. He got killed. And Achitofel, his rabbi, the one that was behind everything, got killed. But for David, it was a little bit too, too little, too late, because he's dying now. That's it. It came to the end of his life. Seven years that Adam Arishon gave him donation, supposed to live a thousand years. And he died 930. Seven years he donated to David Amelech, knowing that uh, Mashiach, the Messiah, would come from King David. And if it would be a miscarriage, there would not be Mashiach. And if there will not be Mashiach, the world will never be corrected from the sin I, I committed, Adam. Adam committed the sin. And the first day was created, already committed the sin. Everything in the world was destroyed. How can you fix the world? With the days of Mashiach. And then Hashem told him, but there's only one problem. David... The founder of Mashiach will not be born. He will die as a miscarriage. And Adam said, cannot be. Take seven years of my life, give it to him. Later he regretted it. Seventy. Seventy, yeah. Seventy years of my life, take and give it to him. And later he regretted it. Shem said, too late. He already got that. So listen, Rabotai. It says like this. We live in a generation that the whole world rebels against God. If we analyze the amount of people in the world, about 8 billion, you don't even have 1% of the amount of the people in the world that deserve to live according to the book of God, not according to me. I don't decide who lives and who doesn't. Just teaching you what's written in the book of God, which, by the way, Christians and Muslims also accepted. They know the Jews got the Torah in Mount Sinai. So therefore, you cannot be a hypocrite. You cannot be a Muslim writing in your Quran and in your Islamic books about Ibrahim and Ismail and Daoud and Yaakub, and all these Jewish legendary holy people from the Torah, and Musa, which is Moshe, and describe that the Jews came out of Egypt, and God saved them from Pharaoh, and gave them the Torah, and took them to the Promised Land. This is all verses in the Quran. And then you come, and you get angry when you read in the Torah that murderers will have a death penalty. Because they like to murder. You like to terrorize people. Same thing, you cannot be a faker Christian saying the Torah was given to the Jews. We follow it. it. We call it the Old Testament. And then when you come to the verse that anyone worship anyone but God deserve to die, and you say, no, that part we don't accept. We worship JC. We have two gods, that God and his son. That's why the Rambam say, people first choose what to do and then they twist the truth according to their needs and desire. The mind is the lawyer of the desire. First you choose what you want to do, you desire someone or somebody, and now you're thinking, how should I do it? It's against the, the divine book. And the brain begins to work a tragedy. So, you know, uh, you do, you're going to say like this, you're going to say like this, that one is worse than you, he did it. Oh, look, even in the Tanakh someone did it. That means it's not the end of the world. 
פלאס, let's say it's bad, אוקיי, you repent, it's יום כיפור in two months. It's time to fix. You young, Hashem is not going to kill you right away. You're only in 20, מה? We'll give you some more time, no, to repent. The brain is a genius to cover for the crimes, supply excuses, explain why not only it's not a sin, it's actually a mitzvah, what I'm doing. Mitzvah to speak Lashon HaRa Banim. You know. So what happened over here? We live in a generation that 99% of the people in the world breaking rules, divine rules, that are forbidden to Gentiles, not just to Jews, every day almost of their life. And Hashem keeps them alive. How many idol worshippers you have in the world? Hundreds of millions of Buddhists, all idol worshipping. <coughs> Christianity, two billion people, <coughs> idol worshippers. Hindus bowing down to cows, to all kinds of gods that they made in their temples. Again, over a billion people in India, in Tibet, in China, in Japan, <laughs> all the, the East over there. They worshipping idols. So many. Now you come to the Arabic world, the Muslim world. They're not idol worshippers. They're very much against it. In an Arab country, you won't find an Arab put a big statue and bow down to the statue. They'll kill him. Very much against it. But the majority of them is poor murder. They want to kill almost everybody. That is not like them. Even Shiites and Sunnis want to kill each other. Very happy when the other side died. Needless to say, when Jews died, they're all happy. Christians died, they're all happy. They want to kill basically the whole world almost. Everyone who doesn't want to be a part of their cult must be dead. When you have a billion, over a billion people that support murder, donate to terror organization, dancing in the street, giving candies when children are being murdered and raped, That's that penalty. That's a death penalty. Right there. Why? You should not kill. It's against the seven laws of Noah. Problem now with the camera. You're making me nervous. <laughs> Every time he walks from his seat to the camera, I lose the ear of my life, I think. <laughs> We... Since I came back from Israel, every one of the lectures was messed up almost. Last week, two lectures. Yesterday, I, I got home, I see the lecture is not on YouTube. But it was uh, something in the page. You do all this work, and in the end, if it doesn't go online, it's like basically you did almost nothing. The entire purpose of those lectures is for the people that would watch it later on. We cut parts from it, we sent to so many places. It's like filling up the bucket and kicking it in the end. <laughs> oh, he has a hole, one of the two. So anyway, so Jews and, and Gentiles that murder deserve death penalty, according to the Torah. Jews and Gentiles that worship idol, death penalty. Certain sex crimes, married women, homosexuality, uh, intimacy with animals, death penalty to Jews and to non-Jews. In the end, when you analyze the world, you don't even have 1% of the amount of people in the world that do not violate crimes against God daily or weekly or monthly on a routine basis that are subject to death penalty. That's right there, almost 8 billion people. And Hashem has so much patience. God is very patient. He let them continue, leave. He gives them money, he gives them health, beautiful homes. 
Look at the sheikhs in Qatar that give all the money to the terrorism to murder people. They live, they make billions with the oil. People that torture slaves in all kinds of countries like China, all, all these dictators. Look in Iran, the Ayatollahs. They live the life and everyone else starves to death there. And Hashem has patience for this kind of people. Same way as patience to all the wicked Jews in Israel, in the government, in the Supreme Court, in the army, in the police, in the schools, in the university, the most wicked people in the world. And he let them live another decade and another decade. Each one of them sometimes violate the rules of the Torah that is subject to a thousand death penalties per week. Per week. Another one, and another one, and another one. Just one Shabbat, every cigarette, death penalty. Violations of Shabbat hundreds of times. And Hashem let them live and make millions and be healthy, drive nice cars, live in nice homes. Why? Anyway, this world is a blink of the eye. For you realize it's over. Who cares? If you will get the punishment when you're 40 or 60 or 80 or in the next world, does it make a difference? Compared to eternity, 10 or 20 more years that Hashem waited with patience. Is it going to change anything? No. What is it like? There is a serial killer that finally the police caught him and have massive amount of evidence against him. And they prepare his case. It takes a few months until the court date. But they're very happy. Why are you happy? The monster is still eating and smiling and watching TV in jail. We gotta get rid of him. I worry. What's the difference? He's only 25. If we kill him in 25 or 25 and a half, what difference does it make? He was supposed to live to 80, 90. We, we're taking 60 years of his life. So let him smile two more months. You get the point or not? He's a dead case, that's it. Same thing Hashem. You mechalel Shabbat, continue to smile. Continue to spit at my Torah every day, continue. But there is another aspect here. When someone does, does wrong by you, you're very hurt, you're very upset, and you are anxious to see revenge. You want to see revenge. I started to give before an example. Someone come to court and uh, he asked the rabbi, he asked the rabbi in the bed, in rabbi, this animal, I slaughter it. Is it kosher or not? The rabbi check, not kosher. Ahmed, take it. You just lost $5,000. It's not upset. Baruch Hashem, it wasn't kosher. Hmm. I lost $5,000 on a cow. But if the bed didn't say you have to give the cow to Reuven, they're fighting over the cow. The bed didn't decided that it belongs to him. You get very angry. Why? When the bed didn't told you the cow is not kosher, you just lost $5,000, you didn't cry, you didn't scream, and you didn't curse the rabbi for telling you that it's not kosher. But when he told you that he's right, the cow belongs to him, please give it to him. He wanted to break the bed in. I'm done with this bed in. I'm done with the rabbis. I have zero faith in them anymore. There's no justice. Why? It's not because of the money. It's the ego. The ego. I don't want to be a loser. They humiliated me. Everybody now going to talk in town that I lost in court. The ego kills the people. If he tells me it's not kosher, it's not an, it's not an ego issue here. When the Arab killed over a thousand of us in one day, it kills us until this man, minute. Why? Ego. These low lives will murder us like this and we are helpless. Couldn't do anything about it until this moment. 
and many of them got away with that and they ran away and this Sinwar now is in Egypt and the other ones are in Qatar living the life. It kills us. Why? Because we have zero faith in God. If we had faith in the Torah and in God, we would be very happy that they escaped. Very happy. Much happier than when, when, we, when we drop a bomb on their head and we found out they died. Why? Every day they live has a massive price for it. Their hell is getting better by the minute. The longer they are here and they don't repent, the more punishment they accumulate. Same thing with wicked Jews. I'm, living, I'm giving you life. You mechalel Shabbat already 10, 20, 30 years. I'm still keeping you around. And not only you don't repent, you continue to add more and more crimes and be become more and more arrogant. What happened? You accumulate more and more punishments. If we know that in the end everyone gets what they deserve, so why are we so uptight? Why are we uptight about the Nazis who escaped to Argentina and lived until 90? What do we care? So now they inhale, 50 years later. What difference does it make? They have an eternal hell. Does it make a difference if they went to hell age 40, 45, 50, or 90? Does it make a difference? They're going to be there billions of years. Who cares if they went there 20 or 30 or 40 years later? Do you get the point or no? Yeah. That's what happened. We don't, we don't learn to why. We don't know the principles. It's all about ego. It's all about revenge. Says Rav Shvadron, we live in a generation that everyone rebel against God. Almost everybody. We, we, the Jews that love to listen to Torah and Musar and ethic, we also commit sins. Usually our sins comes from bad traits, bad personality, ego, anger, jealousy, laziness, stinginess, reasons like that. Also because of desire, desire for food, desire for nice things that are forbidden, desires, lots of desire for luxury, desire for material. But there's one good thing about us. We all love Hashem. The last thing we want is to make him upset or angry or to rebel against him. And the sins that we commit usually is because of desire. It's just like a drug addict. He doesn't want really the drug. He knows it's destroying him. He takes away all his money. So he's to rob people for that. From his own parents he's still. He enjoyed the situation? Of course not. If he does it, because he's a weak character, he cannot live without his desire. So when we violate the rules of the Torah, it makes us feel very bad. Why? Because after the pleasure of the sin is over and there's no more desire for that sin, so now we relax with our desire, now we begin to think, what kind of a loser I am? Look what I've just do it. Why did I have to do it? Why did I have to say? Why did I have to do that? Why did I have to touch? He feels guilty about it. The Gemara says, Someone is embarrassed of his wrongdoing. Hashem is accepting this shame that he has as a repentance. Unlike the wicked heretic, that they choose to be wicked, choose to fight the Torah, choose to speak against the Torah, choose to make people cold, choose to spread heresy everywhere. They have, these people have zero tolerance. When the time comes, they will pay for it forever and ever. Machtiya Rabin. There is a big difference between someone who had a weak moment and he surrendered to his weakness and desire and then went back to good than to someone that made his entire life life of heresy, life of corruption, life that modifies the Torah, 
that spreads the wrong teaching to people Usually, what is the reason that all these people in my blacklist, why they continue to do what they do? They hear the criticism. They all know what I think about them and what I say about them in a lecture. They all know it. Why they continue to become worse and worse every month? They're only becoming worse. Why is it? Mm-hmm. Ego. Yeah, it's all about ego. Ego. Reshaim al pitcha shel geenom enam shavim b'tshuva. When someone asks Santa to be gay, is it abomination? I'm the toeva. No, it's not an abomination. It's just a sin. What do you mean? It's a clear verse in the Torah. Toeva means abomination. It's a verse in the Torah. It's an open for negotiation. Clear verse. When people brought it to his attention two years ago, three years ago, did you ever hear an apology for that? I made a mistake. People make mistakes. Rabbis can also make mistakes. For a moment, I forgot a clear verse in the Torah. Please forget what you heard from me. It is an abomination. It is a death penalty. It is a permanent cut for the soul of these gays in the afterlife. That's written clearly. It just slipped my mind. Did you ever hear such thing? No, you will never hear. Why? The ego. Nobody cares about the truth. What's good for me? What attracts views and money and shows? Why they don't, they're not afraid of what's coming for them? Logically, they should have get very scared what's waiting for them. They, they build a special section for them in hell as we speak. The usual hell is not enough for them, for what they've done, for the destruction they made to the Torah and to the world. Because they have zero faith in Hashem, zero. If you have a Munah in Hashem, you would dare to write a book, I don't need you, I didn't ask to come to the world. You have no right to tell me what to do. I don't owe you any apology. Even if you know about yourself that you are the most righteous person in the world who never committed one sin, like Amram, the son of uh, the father of Moshe Rabenu, or Kilaf, the son of David, or Ishai, the, the father of, uh, of David Amelech. The Gemara brings four, Binyamin, four people. Even if you know about yourself that you are seven years old and you never committed even one sin in your life and everything by you is Bikdusha and Tara, you would never dare to think, to say, I don't owe you an apology. There's no such thing. Someone that dare to say such thing from his mouth, it's the lowest of lowest. There's no lower than that, no lower than that. My opinion, I don't think there's any priest who would dare to say such thing. An idol worshiper who bowed down to J.C. statue, or to his image, and worship a human being. I don't think there's any Muslim in the world who would dare to say such thing. Allah, I don't owe you any apology. I didn't ask you to make me. I don't think so. I just don't think there is anyone who would dare to do such thing. So it's so sad to see what the world has become. This is what it talks. This is 30, 40 years ago. Imagine if we'd live now, Rav Shvadron, and see that. It would get a heart attack from the from the pain to see what what the world has become. And I would like to finish with this. We live in a generation that people are rebelling against God. Revolt. Everywhere revolt. People don't want to listen. People do not want to keep. Don't tell me what to do. Shivim panim la Torah, Rabbi. They found a, a sentence that suits their wickedness. The Torah has 70 faces, meaning you do it this way, I do it this way. They don't even understand what it means, Shivim panim la Torah. They just found, you know, in Israel, 
They are expert on modifying verses to match their evil, wicked way. For instance, they say, leave me alone. You do what you want to do. I don't tell you what to do. You don't tell me what to do. Ish, what do I say? Ish be'ebunato ichye. Ish, a man, would live with his own fate, meaning whatever you want to believe in. You're free. But it doesn't say Ish be'ebunato ichye in the Torah. In Chabakuk, it says Tzadik be'ebunato ichye. They change the righteous man to man, meaning everyone is entitled to his fate. One word changed the whole meaning. Ish be'emunato ichyeh, but it's not written. Oh no? So they'll find another excuse, don't worry. Give them five minutes. Rav Shvadron says, but yom yavo, there will be a day that this revolt will be destroyed. What day? והיה השם למלך על כל הארץ ביום ההוא יהיה השם אחד ושמו אחד We're waiting for that day patiently and at that day there will be one God with one name no more JC, no more Allah, no more Krishna, no more Buddha, no more Maharaji All the, one person, <laughs> there's one speaker in Israel, he has good sense of humor. He asked the rabbi, Rabbi, when Mashiach come, will he destroy the churches and the mask of all the infidels? The rabbi says, say no. So the guy asks, so what good is Mashiach? Why, keep the churches and the mask? So the rabbi told him, no, they will destroy it. What do you mean? From the embarrassment. <laughs> Let's bury every evidence that we were that dumb. We wasted our time on this fate. He won't have to do it. At that time, it will be one God with one name, and it will be obvious, and no more opening for debate. ביום ההוא יהיה השם אחד ושמו אחד. And then השם would say, who is going to be sitting at my table to eat with me? מטאפוריק. Who is going to get close to me now? Only those who were searching to be close to me in the hardest days. Remember with David and Gilad, Barzillai and Giladi, in this hardest moment of the king, when he was miserable and he lost his power and he was basically worthless almost, they ran to be close to him. For us, he's still the king. This is the situation of us today. Hashem, the Torah, it's all in the mud. Wicked people fighting, destroying it. Wicked Supreme Court in Israel make decrees against the Torah. They hate the yeshivot. They want to bury the yeshivot. They want to eliminate every Jewish thing. And if you are religious, immediately they target you. They want to fight you in any possible way. And what do you do? I'm honored, Hashem, to suffer for your, for your name, for your Torah, for your truth. So what? People run away, people make fun, it doesn't bring views, it doesn't bring fame. The truth is the same truth. And the truth will, the truth will always win, will prevail. And that's what he writes. And he says, Ulam ena dvarim amurim bemi shomer en mi shekayem ta Torah. No, no. Nobody wants to be religious. I have to. At least somebody will keep what Hashem said to do. No, so nobody wants to donate to the shul. Okay, I have no choice. I'll give you a check, Rabbi. That's not good. 
That's not even silver. That's not gold, that's not silver. You need to be gold. What are you? I'm a gold member of Hashem. Everything I hear, I run. What can I do? I don't have money, but can I help to build? Can I clean? Can I bring rich people to give? To give me something. Can I hang flyers? Can I send invitations? Can I wash the floor? Can I take out the garbage? Just tell me something. Do, let me do something. Always first one to one and to serve. HaKadosh Baruch Hu asking from us to bring him closer to us. Not, yeah, he's not asking us to bring him closer to us. He's asking us to go close to him. Remember the difference. Because we have nothing without the Torah. Nothing. There's no meaning to the life. So when the next time I, I, somebody is asking money for something that you know Hashem is anxious to have, he's going to be very happy with that. You do not have to sit home and hope that they won't approach you the other way around. You have to call every day, what can I do? How can I help? I can tell you in the 30 years that I work, you can count on one hand. One hand only, not two hands, one. How many people over the years came to me now that I had to come to them, or to talk about it, or to hint to them, or to send someone to talk to them, no. That came to me and say, we would like to be partners in what you do. Tell us what to do, what do you, what do you need? What do you do, what's your next project? How can I sponsor? In one end you can count, in 30 years, from hundreds of thousands of people. You can count on one end. Why? If you don't ask, they don't give. If you don't speak about it in a lecture, they don't give. When I fly to Israel, donation goes down 80%. Check. Check. Since I went to Israel, everyone will check himself and see that up to the time I, was, I went, he was activist. Giving, sending. As soon as I go, two, three weeks, I forget I exist. Forget that. No, no, there's no more yeshiva. There's no more kiruv to do. There's no seminars in Israel. Why? So why they give? Because the rabbi come. <laughs> Copper. Best case scenario, silver. But where are the gold members? Don't exist. Don't exist. Don't exist. This is what Hashem say. Zav v'chesef u'nechoshet. You have to rate yourself. What are you? Are you gold? Probably not. Are you silver? I hope so. At least that. Unfortunately, that's also not the case. Copper. You know what copper means? Hiding. <laughs> I hope I'm not going to get a request. God forbid. Yeah. It's very interesting, you know, how it works. We can, uh, we can find some leniency by reminding you that people have Yetzirah, even inclination. The Satan interest is to make you comfortably numb. Numb. Not thinking automatically remove yourself from any responsibility. When someone brings it to your attention, then you're willing to do something. The question is, why did you have to wait until someone knock on your door? That's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment. You have to wait. You know how people sit in a shul and there are people who come in the morning to the synagogue, they walk. If the guy missed your line, you have to run after him. He's about to leave the shul. Hey, hey, you forgot to take my dollar today. You don't say, ah, Baruch Hashem, he skipped me. I saved the dollar. 
Because if you think like that, all the other dollars you gave, it's almost worthless. You give because you want to save the shame. Do you know how many people give poor people donations, nothing to do with Hashem, just because they want to save themselves the pain? It kills them to see that this person is hungry. Come, I don't have what to do. They shut my electric in my house. My kids are freezing. He's thinking, I, I live in a nice mansion, $10 million here on Ocean Parkway with five chadames. <laughs> and this poor guy from the yeshiva is telling you that these children are suffering at home and they don't have what to eat. I, I cannot go to sleep. It kills me. I'm suffering right now. What is it for me to give $1,000 to, to get rid of the pain I have? That's regardless of religion. Nothing to do with Hashem. He doesn't do it because Hashem said so. He doesn't give it to him because he's a scholar of Torah. No. Just to save himself from the pain. Same thing, a goy will give him the money, an idol worshiper will give him the money, a mechalel Shabbat will give him the money. Why? I'm not giving it to you for you. I'm giving it to you to save myself from the heartache, from the pain I feel right now. You see a homeless checking in the garbage. You stop your car, can I buy you something to eat? Take $20, please buy yourself pizza. Why? You're such a tzaddik? No, no, you're an atheist. You're an atheist, you're a hater of God. So why you stop to give money to the homeless? Because it breaks your heart. That's your nature. F feel terrible. Someone is hungry, looking in the garbage to eat. Feel terrible. That's almost no mitzvah, by the way, you should know. It's a selfish mitzvah. It's a selfish mitzvah. It's like someone who takes a girl to a date, and usually is very cheap, this guy, very stingy, but now is extremely generous. Suffering! For the show off. Why? He wants her to be his wife. He's willing to go out of his way three dates, cry later on at home. Wow, I spent $500 on this dinner. After he nailed the situation, that's when he's going to reveal his beautiful generosity. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? So that generosity right now, it's all corruption. It's all a scam. It's a scam. While he's generous giving someone something, is 100% for selfish reasons. Do you know, you get the point or not? I can give you hundreds of examples, but there's no time. Any questions before we finish? I have a question. Yeah. Um, why is it so detailed in the parasha about all the, like, length and the, the water and the, like, how the Mishkan is built? Why do we care? Why do we care? No, I'm saying, like, what, why is it so detailed? Like, what does it apply to us? We have to know how to build it. <laughs> I'm saying, like, what is it? By the way, to? by the way, I want to tell you something. This parasha, and the next parasha, Truma and Tetzaveh, it's a great proof that the Torah is divine. Like you said, what human being would write so many details? You make the menorah like this, make a nice menorah and that's it. Who cares? Every button, every share has to be for one piece. Who cares if it's one piece or few pieces assembled? In the end, it looks the same menorah. Who cares if you took a one chunk of gold and started to engrave it until you made a menorah. What do, and all these little things it has to be this size, that size, attached, connected with this uh, hook, with the stick inside. What is this? All these strange laws and details shows you that there are huge secrets here. We don't even understand 1% of the secrets here. It's all in, inside divine secrets. And also, by the way, from this parasha, there are three proofs that there is an oral Torah, not just written Torah. Who can tell me which three verses proves it? 
Three times it says, do as I showed you in the mountain. And one place said, do as you were showed how to do in the mountain. Meaning the written Torah proves that there is information that I showed you in the mountain and it's not written in the text. Verbally I showed you how to do it, like a video. Showing you how to make the menorah is one chunk of gold. That's right there, a proof. Besides other verses that say these are the Torahs, plural, that I put in the hand of Moshe in Mount Sinai. Torah, Chukim, Mishpatim, Veluchot Ha'even, and the tablets. Four different things. Torahs, plural, Chukim. Chukim means laws that are against human logic. Just do it. Don't understand the logic here. It's divine logic. It's above your ability. It's mishpatim. It's, it makes sense. Common sense. You stole, you pay. You did this, you compensate the person. This is all logical. And the boards are the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments have extra significance than the rest of the Torah or no? Do we have to look at them as a extra superb words of God or it's no difference between this to any other word in the Torah? No difference. Depends who you ask. If you ask the Sfaradim, no difference. If you ask the Ashkenazim, yes. That's why the Ashkenazim, they rise when you read the Ten Commandments in a shul. Because in their understanding, something extra is happening right now. When we come to the Ten Commandments, everyone should rise. Why they rise? The Sfaradim say, no, you're not allowed to rise. Why? Because by rising, by standing, you show that other parts of the Torah are less important. That's very big danger. This is one of the beautiful arguments between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim, or in general between the Poskim, that both sides are equally right. How can it be one person say go left, one person say go right, and they both right? Can it be or no? If you ask the Sfaradim, they'll tell you why you don't rise, because then people may think that this part of the Torah is more important than the other parts of the Torah. It's dangerous. You see it. Well, very convincing. You come to the Ashkenazim. Why are you standing? Because after all, Hashem gave this part of the Torah separately on a special tablet made in heaven that He made. The other Torahs that we make, we make the cloth, we slaughter the animals, we remove the air, we make the parchments, we sew them, we prepare the whole thing. How many times you had something written on something with the actual finger of God? That's the tablet. Since it was written separately, it has to have some significance that the other Torah doesn't have. So you see, both sides are very convincing. Mm-hmm. And I'll finish with a good joke. Rabbi Ben Zion Shaul used to have a joke that he loved very much. Maybe his most favorite joke. When two people came to him to fight about money, about some issues, because he was a big judge. So when the first one spoke, he said, I hear you, you're right. Then the next one made his case, I hear you, you're right. So the wife, his wife was very sharp. And she had a mouth, she used to talk. And she said, I don't get it. Ben Zion, <laughs> ma, gam u tzodek, gam u tzodek. You also, <laughs> you also right. <laughs> He has to tell her, you're also right. I'm sure you're seeing I'm sure you're seeing now there's a lot of noise going on about the unresolved get cases and they're screaming, making protests and it, it's getting a lot of publicity. And as far as I know, I believe because of the noise some of them do get resolved mm-hmm. in the end. But the problem is that some of the people behind the movement, I 
I don't have to say where they're coming from, who it's a, they interviewed you once in the past, but it's, it's someone that you don't want to be in the same room with. So I'm saying, how, how do people have to look at the movement? It's coming from a bad place, but... Everything that we can do, it's all negative. You have to look at whatever the wicked people do, it's always wicked. The wicked people, they don't do anything for the sake of heaven. The reason they do it is not because they care about justice. Why? They want women to be free from the religious institution. They, they are very much angry that God gave the men power over the women. When a man make a woman mekudeshet, gives her the ring or money or whatever he does, he buys her. The only way she can separate her neshama from him is if he writes her a get. So that means the man has a power over the woman. In the end, the woman is depending on the man willing to let her go or not. So they hate this. Why? Because they are rotten, wicked feminists. Shem Reshaim Irkav, all these people are wicked. And whatever they do, it's not legal. The Torah say how to treat a man that takes advantage on the power that Hashem gave him and he refused to release a woman. What to do to him? I promise you it's much more productive than these wicked low lives. But the problem that we have that these lefty low lives they come to the Torah, to the rabbis, they chop their wings off. You have a bird. The bird can fly with wings, right? You cut the wings of the bird, and now you come to the bird. Shame on you. Why don't you fly? Shame on you. Why don't you fly? I cannot fly because you chopped my wings. I'll explain what I'm saying. The Torah said that if a man refused to give a get to a woman, you bring him to the bed din and you start putting pressure on him. First, you're threatening him, you're gonna, you lose this, you do that, you can't come to the shul, we won't let you pray, you're gonna, you're, we're not going to let your kids come into the yeshiva, all kinds of things. He gets very nervous, and then he gives a get, and that's, usually that's where it ends. More than 90% of the people that refuse to give get, right there will surrender and give a get. Those who will not surrender, in Israel, they put them in jail. They take away their driver's license. They freeze their money budgets from the government. They do all kinds of things. They cannot leave Israel. They cannot fly. Take away the passport. If, okay, if that doesn't help, according to the Torah, you're allowed to take this man and hit him with a whip. Would you sign the get? No. Boom. Would you sign the get? No. Boom. Eventually, you would say yes. So now, well, you know what would happen to the bed din today if they'll do it to the men? They'll get arrested and go to jail for minimum 10 years. It happens to few rabbis who did it. It happened to them. They, yeah, press, the they press charges and they send them for a few years in prison. Why? Because they're threatened men with violence to give get to their wife because they wanted to help the women. So if the bed din will do what the Torah say to do, they'll all get arrested. So the lefty liberal wicked law lives make liberal rules that no one is allowed to use violence against a man that refused to release his wife. If you will do it, we will arrest you. Ah, now when, so we lost all our power. We can help the women. Oh, religious the religious people are cruel, they don't care about women, they don't give them get, they don't care that they stay alone for the rest of their life, they're a bunch of chauvinists. We, the feminist wicked lefties, we will release women from this slavery. That's the biggest hypocrisy. Hashem will give them what they deserve, don't worry. <laughs> their time will come, just like every other wicked liberal. They'll get what they deserve. If they would let the bed din do what the Torah say, there would not be one woman in the world that wants to be divorced and she won't get a get. You won't find. The reason you have women that cannot get get right now is because the secular court eliminate the power of the rabbinical court. They do it in Israel, they do it here, everywhere else. Every democratic, rotten government 
make sadomized rules and some of the rules are the reason why some women are stuck with no get. They let the bed in handle it, according to halacha. <laughs> no man would even think to say, I'm not giving a get. However, I just want to make a side comment that sometimes the man has a reason not to give a get. There is some reason. If the woman is some monster who did horrible things to him, who stole away his money, who cheated on him, who did horrible things to the kids, or she's a drug addict, or stuff like that, and she wants all kinds of rights, that if you give it to her, will destroy the life of his children. Mm-hmm. So there's a reason why Hashem gave the man extra more power than the woman. Right? Because in the end, who's going to raise the children after the divorce? The woman. What happened if she became a Chalil Shabbat? She started to dress like a prostitute. She has a non-Jewish boyfriend that wants to take her to Mexico now. She's going to take the kids out of yeshiva, destroy their souls, go somewhere. Now, now, you know, he can still have some power over her. If you, if you take it away from him, from the man, that's a, a, no woman will have anything that keeps her in, in track. It's a complicated thing. Sometimes the man is right, sometimes the woman is right, sometimes both of them are wrong, sometimes both of them are right. It's just not a good match. Sometimes they are not supposed to get married to begin with. Many couples get married and it wasn't the will of God. It's not the will of Hashem. Why they get married? Sexual attraction. She's very pretty, he's very handsome, and they decided that they're a good match. What about their ideology? Heaven and earth, two opposites. What about the Rirat Shamaim? No connection whatsoever. There's nothing between them besides a nice face to him and a nice face to her. That's it. That's not how you get married. You're not dogs. It doesn't work like that. Plus, some of them were brainwashed by the Shatchanim who wanted to make commission. You know what Shatchan means? Shin, Dalet, Chaf, Nun, Sheker, Dover, Kesef, Notel. Not all the Shatchanim. Some Shatchanim are very good for the sake of heaven. Even when you want to give them something, they refuse to take. You must give them something. <clears throat> but some Shatchanim, as long as they make the Shidduch, it's like a real estate agent. He wants you to buy the house because it's going to make 4%. Ah, the house is terrible for you. He knows that there's noise there, and uh, wow, wait until 4 p.m. when the kids comes out to recess in a school over here, and there's a cellular antenna over here who caused cancer to few other tenants in the block. It's not going to tell you all of that. You can drop dead he, as long as he makes this $40,000 commission. He doesn't care. What is he going to say? Well, I want you to know if you buy this house, you'll be in the hospital next year. Why? Because he was, and he was, and he was. They're not going to tell it to you. So some shot Hanim, as long as they close the deal, they make some nice profit, and that's it. But some are not like that. But some people got married because of the advice of the shot Hanim. That's why you need a rabbi, not a shot Han, to tell you what to do. You come to a rabbi, you hear, he hears what you say, he analyzes the situation, he gives you an advice. He should or he should not get married. But I want everyone to know, the Chazonish say, and many other rabbis repeated it, in Shiduchim, everything is important. Ideology, righteousness, Torah, Midot. But there is one thing that is on the top of the list. The top of the list. Do you know what it is? Metziat Chen. You like her as a woman, the way she looks, or not? You, you, a woman, you like him as a man, you like his look, you like his height, you like his face, you like his body, is it too fat for you, too skinny for you, too short, too tall? You like his nose, you don't like his nose. If there are things that doche, that makes you disgusted, that's not a shiduch. Because when your shiduch comes, doesn't matter pretty, ugly, you feel attraction. 
For him, she's pretty. That's, it. That's all it matters. The rest of the world, who cares what they think? You see that he's, wow, every time he sees her, he's super excited. That's his shidur. And when she sees him, nobody understands what she's seeing him, <laughs> as far as they look. For her, it's the whole world. Yeah. And that's all what matters. The problem, if that doesn't exist, it's not the right shidur. You have a nice, righteous roommate. Talmid Chacham, Tzadik. He's a nice roommate. You have to spend the next 40 years with him in a bedroom. Living with someone you don't like. You know how many houses are breaking later on because of this? Some people think it's a shame to like someone physically, to be attracted. They don't understand it's the rule number one in the Torah. They have to be intimate and become one. Physically. Of course, emotionally, spiritually, all follows. There's no connection. There's no marriage. A woman refused to go to the mikveh. The marriage is finished. If she's mechalel at Shabbat, the marriage is not finished. If she eats pork on Yom Kippur, the marriage is not finished. If she refused to go to the mikveh, you must rule divorce right away. Why? Because there's no marriage without intimacy. If there's no intimacy, there's no marriage. It's two roommates living together. The Torah doesn't want roommates, man and, and a woman. The Torah wants love and intimacy. You understand? I can give you a thousand sources now, but that's not the topic. I spoke about it in my other topic when it speaks about relationship. You should listen to it. Any more questions? Everything is clear. Now we can go. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Hanan Yabena Kashiyah. Amen.